Okay, we are live. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here for another talk in the Valongo seminars. So today we have the great pleasure of having with us uh, Dr. Lohan Saban. And I'm sorry about the pronunciation if it's not perfect, but uh, Dr. Lohans, after a master in physics and astronomy at the University of Antilles Guyane in Guadeloupe, French West Indies, and the University of Nice, uh, France, she obtained her PhD at uh, Jodrell Bank Center for Astrophysics in Manchester, UK, in 2008. Then she did two postdoctoral stays in Mexico at Yunnan in Ensenada, Baja California, and the University of Guadalajara. Since 20, uh, 2015, she's a member of the academic staff of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México in Ensenada, where she's working on the study of the evolving objects forming the interstellar medium. Her two main axes of research are the analysis of nebulae in the E-gaps field and the analysis of magnetism in planetary nebulae and pre-planetary nebulae. So today, uh, Dr. Lohans, will talk to us a little bit more about uh, the searching for extended emission objects with IFAS. So, uh, Lohans, welcome to our seminars, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. So I'll switch off my camera so you can, you can hear us better, and also you can start your talk. So whenever you're ready, so feel free to start. Welcome, and thank you very much for your participation. Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you, Luan, for, and thank you also, Denise, uh, for the invitation. So um, I'm going to start uh, to talk to you about what I've been working on for a couple of years now. Uh, I will switch off my camera, so just to keep the stream uh, going better. And let's, uh, let's start. Let me share my screen. Okay, Luan, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, everything is fine. You Perfect. can go ahead. All right. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, searching for extended emission objects with a survey, uh, as I said, that I've been working on. Actually, that was my PhD subject, the IFAS, the INT Photometric H Alpha Survey. And uh, first, I'm going to start about talking a bit the setting the stage. The stage is the galactic plane. So as we all know, the galactic plane is the place of birth of a lot of stars. So star, it's a star from the region area. You have massive remnant stars. All of this means that you have uh, a large amount of gas, a large amount of dust causing opacity, large opacity, and most of all, causing extinction. So it's a really interesting place to go to at least to study, but you are um, there are some issues with that extinction that really prevents you from going really inside, really deep inside and see what's going on. So that's mean, as I say, that there's difficult there's we have difficulty finding some stellar objects, for example, um, if you want to do census, so if you want to do any statistical analysis on a particular population and that you target this uh, this um, plane, this galactic plane, so it's a bit difficult due to uh, what you cannot see. So I'm going to focus uh, on planetary nebulae because this is what I've been working on for quite a while and this is my... Uh, most interesting subject. Although we are gonna, I'm gonna show you later on that we are not only working on planetary nebulae, but also on other emission, uh, emission type nebulae. So uh, planetary nebulae, they are shells of ionized gas around uh, evolved stars. They are the remnant or they are the evolution of solar-like stars between one and eight solar masses. So on the right hand side, you have an HR diagram showing you basically all the um, all the path that uh, solar type stars will uh, go through until um, until reaching the planetary nebulae phase. So the planetary nebulae, similarly to their um, um, predecessor, the asymptotic giant branch stars, they are really important for the interstellar medium because they refurbish it in new material. 
whether it's um, you have gas, you have dust, you have in the gas, you have the molecules. So that's um, those are really important objects. Also, those are the most numerous objects. The, all the stars between that um, in that mass range are the most numerous in our galaxy. So planetary nebulae will be also in a large number. So you would expect them to be very, very important for the galaxy. So except for that, for uh, the fact that they enrich the interstellar medium, they are also, uh, if you take them um, as individual, they're really what they call plasma laboratory objects because you have a lot, a lot of processes occurring in those, uh, in those um, objects. You have photoionization, recombination, shocks, you have cooling, you have magnetism, you can study binarity because uh, we've seen that a lot of them, if not most of them, could be in a binary, um, been in a, could be binary, sorry, and not single stars. You can study the dynamics, the kinematics, all of them, they are their proper way of uh, evolving their mass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have plenty, plenty of processes that, oh, that are occurring in those objects. And those objects, they are short-lived, only 10 to 20,000 years. So, and you can study them from the X-ray to radio wavelengths. So really, they are, um, I hope that I convinced you that planetary nebulae uh, are very important and interesting object to study. Also, the fact that they are pretty beautiful objects. So you can see here different type of, uh, of planetary nebulae and you can see the gas which is expelled. And the first thing that you can notice is that the gas is not expelled for most of them in a random way. So you have some really well-defined pattern, the bipolar, you have elliptical, you have, but you have also round planetary nebulae. So all those objects um, are the ones that we are studying in our group. So there's plenty of questions about that. How many planetary nebulae do we have in our galaxy? Because if they are supposed to be the descendant of the most numerous objects, that mean the intermediate mass stars, so we should find a lot of them. So how many exactly? Do we have an abundance gradient? We know that they, as I say, that they are very important for as the EGB starts to um, disseminate material into the, the, the galaxy. So do they do that in a, a random way or do you have a, a, some order like a gradient, for example? and their distribution, if there's a space density, the scale eight, the birth rate of planetary nebulae, are they uh, distributed in a preferential way in the galaxy? For example, based on their morphology. So far, what we've seen is that um, the bipolar one, which are uh, deriving from the most massive objects are located lower on the plane and the least massive are higher up on the plane and the least massive are more likely to give round planetary nebulae. So is that a distribution valid with, um, with what we know actually of the, of the planetary nebulae? Do we have a dominant bipolar morphology? I show you some objects, some, um, some images of planetary nebulae and what we know is that what we've seen so far is that um, 80 percent of those planetary nebulae show more, more or less 80 percent show a bipolar morphology and you have a 20 percent which are rounds uh, and then you have to remember that from the mean sequence to let's say the agb the morphology is round you have spherical objects so you have a shift from spherical to non to totally non-spherical so you have to understand uh, to have to understand that so to do all those uh, studies, which are um, based on having a lot of objects. So we see that we have a bias. Why? Because all the, um, the knowledge that we have, at least most of the knowledge that we have, is based on the brightest, the brightest targets, which is normal. You will use what you can study best. So um, we have a bias. We are biased against the very bright and nearby objects. So who are the missing ones? As, um, as I say that we are trying to find out how many planetary nebulae we have in the galaxy. Uh, there, were some, there are some estimations, for example, Fru et al. in, two, Fru in 2008, in PhD thesis, sorry, uh, say that we had, it 
computed that we have around 24,000 plus or minus 4,000 uh, galactic planetary nebulae in the disk and the bulge. You have numbers that varies to 46,000 up to 60,000 planetary nebulae. But whatever this number, the fact is that right now, we only know around 3,500 planetary nebulae. So we are missing a lot of them. That means that everything we know are based on at least less than those 3,000 objects. And with those objects, we are trying to figure out a whole population. So you can see where is the issue. So the missing one are the planetary nebulae, which are hidden in the interstellar medium due to the extinction that we discussed uh, at the beginning. You have the old planetary nebulae. Those planetary nebulae, which are starting, which the, the envelope is starting to disseminate into the emerging, into the, the interstellar medium, which means that they have a very low surface brightness. So those are particularly difficult to detect. You have the planetary nebulae, um, which are located in the anti-center, the galactic anti-center. This is the, of course, this is the region opposite to the galactic center, which is less studied in the, um, just for the observers, just to know that though this region is seen really in winter and most of the time at winter time, this is not the best to, uh, to observe. Either you have very good night or very bad night. So you ha it's a bit difficult observationally speaking to have, um, uh, to have those, um, those images, those detection of those uh, of this planetary nebulae in this region. You have the very distant planetary nebulae that can be unresolved and we do not distinguish them as nebulae. So they are probably skipped when with the, they were probably skipped in other surveys. And finally, you have the planetary nebulae, which are in um, areas that are really, really crowded with other stars, for example. And as the, the, the very distant one, they are skipped, okay? So those are um, the, all the objects that the, the characteristic of the planetary nebulae that we that are missing from our senses to have a very good um, a very good analysis of the population of planetary nebulae. So, what we need it's of course a dedicated survey for those objects. So we are going to do that in H alpha, of course, because H alpha will trust the ionize uh, the new ionized emission, and it's associated to either the very young or the very evolved object. So the very young object you have the Titori, Abigaro, the H two region, and the evolved you have the planetary nebulae post HEBs, but you have also the massive stars like uh, Volfri. Uh, LBV, the supergiant, etc., etc. So we're going to use the um, survey in H alpha to try to detect those missing planetary nebulae. Of course, we're not the first one doing uh, surveys. There have been H alpha surveys uh, in the past. So here on the uh, you have um, in that table I listed some of the surveys that are um, that occurred in the south, in the southern hemisphere, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and the type of um, type of survey, so you have photographic plates, uh, CCDs, those others using uh, kinematic surveys. You have different type of spatial resolution, for example, from the you can go to the uh, the degree or to the arc minute down to the uh, to the arc seconds. So what we need to really be able to complete the census, to find those, plan those planetary, those missing planetary nebulae. It's an imaging survey where you have both a large coverage and a high spatial resolution. This is where you have IFAS. So IFAS is the, um, stand for INT, uh, sorry, for, actually it's INT photometric surface survey for, and INT is another acronym. So it's an acronym in an acronym. It's for the Isaac Newton telescope photometric H alpha survey. So the Isaac Newton telescope is in La Palma in the Canary Islands. So it's a fully pho uh, photometric CD survey. It will scan the northern galactic plane, uh, the northern galactic plane between minus five and five uh, degrees actually. So we are not scanning the whole galactic plane. We, uh, the PI is Janet Drew uh, and she started the, um, this, um, this project in 2003 actually. The Isaac Newton, uh, just to, uh, for those who do not know that uh, that telescope, so it's the one in the picture, it's a 2.5 meter telescope. Uh, we use the wide field camera. Uh, and the 
CCD got the pixel scales of 0.33. So to that, uh, this time, this is the best uh, resolution that, uh, that we can have. The observing the survey lasted from 2003 to 2008, at least for the first point in coverage, because we, do, we did a second pass. And uh, it ended around 2014, 2015, actually. So as I said, uh, we're scanning the, um, the galactic pain latitude between minus 5 and 5 and a total of 1,800 uh, 1, square degrees. We chose, all the, um, we chose the La Palma because of the good observing um, conditions. So the median seeing was around 1.1 uh, arc seconds. And finally, concerning the photometric calibration, so the latest calibration was done by in the or second release by Barron Senetal 2014. So those who are interested can go refer to that to that paper for the photometric calibration. The filters. So we use three filters: H alpha, R and I, Sloan R and I. So the we have 120 second exposure in H alpha. Note that the H alpha filter uh, also include the nitrogen 26583 uh, emission. So you have a combination of H alpha plus N2 actually in your images, and uh, of course for the you have a third less time for the for the background like a, you have the 30 seconds in r and 10 seconds in i how far can we go because that was an issue that we had to detect in the case of planetary nebulae of course uh ah, something that i need to, to just to point out ifas was not made for planetary nebulae in particular it was made for different kind of um actually all type of H alpha emitting object in the galactic plane. But of course, as I said, we are interested in planetary nebulae. So the depth is really important for us. How far can we go? Because we are trying to retrieve all those faint objects that could that we missed from uh, other uh, other surveys. So in terms of point source, we can go down for our magnitude uh, to 20, 19.5 to 20. And for the extended image emission, we can go to an, uh, down to an H alpha surface brightness, uh, 2.2 uh, times 10 to the minus 70 Hertz per uh, centimeter square per second for hexagon square. And finally, well, we have a proper nomenclature. So if you go in, uh, you can type IFAS, um, you can type the IFAS nomenclature and find the object which is already in all the, all the catalog, like Sinbad, for example. So we have two nomenclature, one for the compact and one for the extended. The only difference is that the extended, we have an X after IFAS. On the right, I'm showing you just uh, an example of a candidate, which later turned out to be a good uh, real planetary nebulae, a bona fide planetary nebulae, where you have the emission, the bright emission in H alpha plus N2, and the emission in R and the emission in I. And then uh, on the bottom, you can see the, um, the transmission for the different filter that we are using. So as I said, we are uh, in IFAS. We have uh, we are the um, nebulae group. We are a group working on planetary nebulae and on evolved nebulae in particular. So our goal is to search, in this case, for planetary nebulae and other nebulae across the northern uh, the northern plane. We com we target not only extended but also compact objects, and we are using two different methods: photometry and mosaicing. And I. Right now, we'll go through those two different meters. So the first one is the photometric. So uh, what kind of object are we targeting in particular? So all the very compact planetary nebulae, all the very compact nebulae in general, and everything which is point source. So uh, what we're doing, we are using color-color diagrams. So you have, uh, we construct those diagrams from the uh, from the IFAS data. Uh, for example, you have the air, air the R minus H alpha versus R minus I. And we can combine also those, uh, those table with a two mass, um, two mass um, color, color diagram to 
better constrain the nature of our objects. So uh, I present you two different um, two different diagrams coming from the article by Coradi et al. in 2008 and Viron et al. in 2009. So Romano Coradi was most interested in symbiotic stars. So here you can see the diagram that he, um, that he could obtain for the R minus H alpha versus R minus I and the distribution of the different type of symbiotic, uh, of symbiotic stars. And uh, you have also on the, uh, the other diagram, the same, but using the two mass data with the uh, same, also separating the different type of symbiotics and other objects. So using those uh, color color diagrams, we can um, separate the different objects and try to figure out what they are. We can classify them. Uh, Kertu Vironen, which uh, has a catalog in 2009, uh, she was more involved in the detection of planetary nebulae using that technique. So um, the latest on this is that now we have uh, recalculated the astrometry. So you have an article from Mongio et al. in 2020, so last year, about, so if you want all the, diff the latest um, data on the astrometry, and also it includes the photometry of all those uh, all the targets in IFAS. So I recommend you this article. Actually, you see that this article is called the Merge IFAS and UVEX Optical Survey. At uh, some point, I will talk to you about what is UVEX. Now the mosaic. So I was most involved in this part of the of the work that. Actually, that was some part of a uh, big part of my uh, of my PhD, and I'm still working digging on those mosaics. So what we did is um, we create two degrees squared h alpha minus r. That means that we remove the continuum. Uh, we create those mosaics from all the IFAS frame that uh, that were obtained during the during the survey, and we did that to uh, detect extended nebulae. So all the um, the characteristic, the constraint that we have for those, the construction of those mosaics are in those uh, in this table. And something very important here is that we use beaming factors. We have the 15 and 5 pixels beaming. I will tell you in a minute why we have those and why those are important. So the detection of those extended nebulae was totally visual and we have we created like more than 1,500. So we have really a lot of um, a lot of data to look through. So using the meaning, what we can do is that we can target different sizes of planetary nebulae and different uh, brightness detection level. Okay, So we have, as I said, we have two uh, different binning, the 15, um, 15 pixels binning that correspond to five hexagon binning with the wide field camera. That means that one pixel represents five hexagons on the sky. So we use that uh, large beaming to resolve the very, I probably should have put a very here, the very low surface brightness object. Really, we are going through the limit to what IFAS can do. And then we can accentuate everything, which is the contour, the shape of the nebula. So all those old planetary nebulae uh, that we have inside the, um, the galactic plane, so we can try to retrieve them. And the five by five pixel beaming, so that's um, 1.7 hexagon beaming with the wild feed camera. So this is to detect the intermediate size nebulae. That means that they are not really low surface brightness. It can be a bit brighter, but they are not compact. They are not point source. That means that the photometry could miss those objects, but at least we can pick them up. So. Basically, those are uh, objects um, smaller than 15, although we can have those that uh, we can pick up those type of uh, 15 to 20 hexagons in the diameter. So um, it's important to uh, notice that those objects at the smallest binning, generally, you cannot find them in the high binning. So really, you need those two to really have those, uh, those two binnings to really detect those two populations of, uh, of objects. So I'm going to just show you um, a mosaic. So here on the, the big one is our two degrees uh, squares mosaic. And you can see that you have uh, popping up, you have here 
that uh, that H2. Um, so you have that um, that region here. You have the um, in three. You have what they call the elephant trunk, and here in that region, if you dig a bit more, you can see that sphere here, which is a new ionized sphere, actually. What are the issues? Because the problem uh, with uh, mosaics is that, uh, well, there actually there's plenty of little problem with the mosaics. So you have the sky background difference between the H alpha and the R image. So um, when you do the, the subtraction, you can have some issue. So that's why we created confidence map to vet um, the, bad, the bad images. Then you have the artifacts at, this, at the edge of the CCDs, oh, which are due to the scene, the difference in scene. So uh, what we can do um, to get this, uh, this effect, what you can do is observe the different individual frames. And you can see if this artifact uh, is repeating in all the frame. And if it's an artifact like, for example, the CCD age or something like that. So this is something punctual. So it's not supposed to occur every time you observe the same field. Because as I said, we have different tasks uh, when we observe during, with IFAS. So some region I observe um, once or twice or, or more. So you have the, the good thing is that you can have different images are taken at different times. So that would be, uh, with that, we are able to say if an object that we are seeing, for example, here on the top right, this is an artifact. This is something which is not occurring in other in another frame. You have the bad images due to the weather conditions. So that uh, needs uh, reobserving. Re -observing. For example, this is the case uh, for the anti center. And uh, something, an issue, but it's, well, it's more a um, practical issue, is the weight. Uh, the 15 pixel being mosaic, each mosaic is a 20 megabyte, and the 5 pixel meaning it's 135 megabytes. So you have to, you need somewhere to store all those data, and all those data are in a Cambridge, uh, in the database in Cambridge, actually. So um, the first thing that we did is that we took all the, um, all the mosaics in the 18 to 20 region. So we did a visual inspection with the five pixel binning and we detected around 233 potential PNA just in two hours of uh, right ascension. And uh, we have more than 3,000 objects over the whole area so far. And this is only the first task, that's been the first detection. So in terms of planetary nebulae, so those are the candidates that we have. We found uh, 100 which are already known, and the candidate, we, uh, uh, we have those 233. All those are candidates. And as I said, we are not, not only interested in uh, planetary nebulae, but we look for other type of objects. So those are the numbers of known uh, in then all the candidates. So just to show you some example of object that we um, that we could uh, unveil, as we can as you can see, those are pretty um, those are pretty faint, and um, we understand now why they were not detected before. So, oh, sorry. So here you have another type of object. Here you can only see a rim. So this is a planetary well. If it's a planetary nebulae, at least it's something. It's a nebulae which is interacting with its interstellar medium. So uh, we uh, we assume that it, we think that it would be uh, the chances that it would be a planetary nebulae would be uh, pretty high. And you have all those shells where I will discuss a bit uh, a bit more later. After that, of course, when you have your candidates, you need to go to the spectroscopy. But here again, because we are looking for very faint objects, so the brightest one. 
uh, we can go, you can go to a two meter class telescope to do the spectroscopy. But for a lot of them, we had to go to the to bigger telescope. For example, the, uh, the GTC, which is a 10.4 meter telescope to do the, um, the spectroscopic identification. So this is, a, of course, you can imagine that this is a large program and then this, which is still ongoing. So in 2014, we published the first catalog of um, of um, planetary nebulae, of extended planetary nebulae, where we have 159 true, likely, and possible planetary nebulae. So you see that we had to um, we had to do some categories because some of them were so faint, and we have even with the 10 meter telescope, there were so few lines that sometimes it was not we couldn't say for at 100 percent that there were planetary nebulae. So still uh, got the possible um, the possible status. So their distribution, so here you have in black, the, uh, the plain black dots are the IFAS objects. And um, the, um, the non-empty one are the Strasbourg ESO object and, um, and the cross are the match uh, objects, which are, different, uh, which are different surveys. So then you can see that we are putting a lot more objects at, uh, on those, long at those uh, longitude, for example. Here, the distribution in size. So we have a really long, uh, very large, really broad uh, size range for those objects. The morphology. So as uh, here, we, for example, we find pretty, uh, quite a high number of Rhone planetary nebulae, um, which is the same number of bipolar that we are finding, actually. It's interesting because the, one of the issues that some people were raising is that we do not find we do not find that many wrong planetary nebulae because those wrong planetary nebulae may have a much lower surface brightness than the bipolar one. So here we are unveiling even more round planetary nebulae. Then uh, I'm going to go to the follow-up analysis. So what we are doing uh, from now. So uh, we are still working on the identification, as I told you. So there will be a next uh, release by uh, Ritter et al. in preparation. So one of the objects in this catalog will be that one, which is IFAS X for short 1911-04. So this is an article, a separate article by Rodriguez Gonzalez published this year. So here we have GTC, actually it's a GTC spectrum. Uh, that we um, that we obtain to study this really um, um, it's really faint planetary nebulae, and something interesting in the catalog, the next release that's gonna come out from um, from Reuters is that it includes a lot of amateurs discovery. The um, the group of amateur astronomers has been really valuable because they also go through those mosaics or they go to the they go to the same sky as um, the same surface, the same region, sorry, as, uh, as IFAS. And they also image, because they have more time, of course, they can image for a long time all those, uh, some areas and find also adding more planetary nebulae that we might have missed or not. So those, uh, they're, um, what they are doing is really important and so important that we are in communication with them and they, their discovery will be part of that, uh, of that new release. Then we have the deep imaging, because once you have those objects that you identify them as planetary nebulae, it would be interesting to study them in, with depth. And depth actually is an issue in terms of imaging, because I, rem uh, I remind you that we only observe the object, for example, in H alpha, it's, I put H alpha plus, because you remember that it's H alpha plus nitrogen two, we only use, uh, it, uh, we only use 120 second exposure. So with that, you cannot have the details. So we have uh, started um, an analysis of deep imaging in the most important filter, which are H alpha, nitrogen two, and oxygen three filter, of course, the narrowband filter, to have the details of those objects. And so we can unveil small structure, for example, like knots, the, we can look at the ionization condition of those objects. So we are working, uh, so this is a program that we are working on that we hope to present this year. 
We also did the follow-up analysis on the infrared emission, and in particular, the molecular hydrogen emission. So it's a work by Ramos Lario et al. in 2017. So we tried to figure out if those evolved objects still add this, uh, those molecular emission and how they compare to other planetary, other brighter planetary nebulae, for example. And uh, finally, I'm going to just uh, show you the latest article that we have on the, the follow-up on the physical parameter, the chemical analysis, the morphokinematic uh, analysis also of those, uh, of those objects. So this year, we had three papers published by our, by our group on those uh, particular objects. So the master plan would be to be able to study all those faint objects to have all their characteristic, whether it's the, phys uh, the physical con uh, condition, electronic and dense, um, and uh, electronic temperature and density, sorry, uh, the, um, the chemistry, the abundances actually, and uh, the um, expansion velocity to be able to derive their age, etc., etc. And we also do uh, using shape, we also do a morphokinematic model, actually, of those 3D models of those objects. So if we can study uh, with depth the greatest number of objects, we will be able to have an idea of the population of all B8 behavior, the characteristic of those evolved planetary nebulae. So in summary, so we have seen that our follow-up analysis include uh, spectroscopy, either for identification or for um, uh, deep analysis, the deep optical imaging, the multi-wavelength and multi-technique analysis, and also the study of the central star. Because of course, this is something that is an inherent part of planetary nebulae. It's not only the nebulae, it's also the central star, which is ionizing all this gas. So um, here you can see that image, uh, which is on the top, which is the image of the Niklas nebulae. So you can see in the center, you can, the, the planetary nebula, the central star, the central star has actually been the subject of at least two papers, one by uh, Koradi et al. in 2011, and another by Mizalski et al. in 2013. And we also try to detect those, uh, those uh, stars the central star with other objects. For example, here on the bottom, you have possible candidate um, planetary nebulae, uh, candidate central star planetary nebulae. So we are using a survey called UVEX. So UVEX is, uh, is the ultraviolet excess survey. So it's a survey by uh, Groot et al. So basically it's the same as IFAST, that means is uh, targeting the same area the only thing that's going to change is that we're going to have blue filter, like, for example, the U, uh, the U filter, the G filter, for example, and for some, for some frame, you have even the helium-1 and helium-1 filter. So if we can uh, have the blue images, so then using uh, RGB images, we can try to see if we can observe, detect the central star. And here you can see, well, in those two objects that we have that in the geometric center, we have this blue component, which is the central star. And then we can have an idea of, uh, of course, where it is. And now we can do all the same follow-up analysis, mostly the spectroscopy to study the characteristic of those evolved stars. Now, let's go uh, a bit far away from the planetary nebulae, because as I said, we are not only studying planetary nebulae in the group, we study uh, remnants, uh, for example, supernova remnants. So we detected um, five new using the same mosaics uh, with their radio counterpart. So those five new is a new addition to the um, to the catalog of um, the catalog of uh, supernova remnant, uh, which is interesting as well because those this particular class of objects is also suffering of a census problem. Okay, so we had their expected around like 1,000, and they have uh, I think that now a bit more than 300, but not much than that. Uh, supernova remnants found. So there's still that census issue as well in this category of objects. So here is just uh, showing you the, the different um, spectra that we observe and also something that we can do is implement 
uh, with all new data, it's implement those uh, diagnostic diagram to detect uh, to detect the different kind of uh, of objects. And finally, the Nove, uh, we uh, were able to uh, identify to detect also in those mosaics a very nice Nova, which is that one, which is uh, IFAS X twenty one o two o four for short, and. Of course, we did a uh, very, uh, very deep analysis. You can find it in the Guerrero et al. and the Santa Maria et al., those two published in 2018 about the, um, the type of NOVA that we have. The, we could also um, determine the period, which is in that case a 4.2 hours uh, period for that object. And the most or most recent uh, analysis by Toala et al. in 2021, is uh, just published. Uh, you can find it in the in the ADS right now. It's the X-ray analysis, and we see that we have emission. We do not have an extended emission of X-ray. We have the an X-ray which is uh, confined around the um, the central system actually. So those are the type of object that we discover with IFAS and that uh, when you do the um, follow-up analysis, the deep follow-up analysis, you can uncover very, very interesting objects. So, uh, can we do better in terms of detection? And so far, I've, I show you different, uh, I mostly focus on the visual search for, the, for those planetary nebulae, the extended one at least. And, um, but I will talk about also the RGB imaging, uh, imaging and the use of machine learning. So the visual search, um, the pro and the con. The con is that, it's, of course, it's long because you have to look at through all those different uh, mosaics and it can be painstaking. The pro is that, um, in my experience, your, a your eyes or your brain, actually, is the better tool to detect those um, directly to detect the artifact, to uh, pick up what is a nebulae, the very faint one, the filament. So, and that process is becoming really, of course, is becoming quicker with time because you learn. So I think that the visual search can is a very, although long, although painstaking, it's a very uh, strong and useful tool to detect those objects, those faint and uh, those faint nebulae. There's also, we use also the RGB search. So it's a color, what we did, we did color composite mosaics. So we use the mosaic that we had and we had the H alpha minus R and we produce H alpha, the quotient, H alpha uh, divided by, uh, the, um, by the R filter. And this was to detect the intermediate size nebulae. So uh, it was easy using a system of color that you uh, assign to the different type of, uh, of mosaics, you can, quickly discriminate the nebulae from the simple star. So this method was used, for example, in the MASH survey. So it's an article for uh, Nizalski, or Brent Nizalski. So the pro is that it's very quick, actually. The con is that uh, it doesn't work for the very extended planetary nebulae, only for the compact object. And uh, the artifact in that case can be an issue, but in the end, it's still a uh, visual, uh, visual analysis. Of course, it's, as I said, it's quicker than the not using it, but it's still something that you have to check by eye. What's next? Um, what we would, something that could be interesting is um, to use is machine learning. So the pro is that it's gonna be uh, automated, an automated process, it might be quicker. Of course, once you have your uh, neural network, which is trained to recognize the different pattern that you assign to it, if it's the, it's a shape, if say it's a color, for example, the con is that um, with the mosaics that we have, the artif again, the artifacts must, might be uh, an issue because all this will depend, of course, of the quality of the of your uh, of your images. So you really ne need something which is neat to be able to uh, to work uh, well, to use the most, to make the best, the most of your uh, the machine learning analysis. And uh, the reliability is that if you use this, you sh it should not need a visual inspection. So that would be something that we can, that we could uh, consider. So for example, in IFAS, one simple strategy would be to use the, um, the RGB, uh, the RGB data, 
to have a binary indicator. That's mean based on the color, for example, it is a planetary, it is a nebula, or it is not a nebula, and you have the selection and the subsequent analysis, as I told you about, which is the spectroscopy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that could be something that can be uh, that could be implemented. However, it could what we well not really however, but more better in addition to what uh, to IFAS. So we could use other tools to complete our IFAS data. For example, we have a uh, uh, JPAS, right? I put it in uh, in Spanish, a uh, JPAS. Sorry. Uh, which could be in the future a complementary survey because, of course, um, for those who do not know, so this is a, a survey which is going to uh, use more than 50 narrowband filters. So we could select the, filter that, the filters that are in, of interest for us, for example. And something else that uh, I would like to mention is that if IFAS target the northern hemisphere, we have also VFAS plus targeting the southern hemisphere. So VFAS plus is a combination. It's like you have IFAS plus UVEX. So you have red and blue filters, but targeting the south with the bulge, etc. So I arrived to the conclusion of my talk. So um, IFAS, um, it's a survey. Although the survey is done, it, I think that now is when the work starts because we are still unveiling a lot of new nebulae. Uh, well, and of course, as I said, interesting planetary nebulae, but not only, we have new, uh, as I show you, we have new remnant uh, supernova, we have new nova, we have uh, new symbiotic stars, for example. And that will be, uh, in the end, something that will help us solving the bias problem. And as I, told, as I show you, it's not only the planetary nebulae, uh, area, the planetary nebula population that we have that bias problem. We have it in other, with other type of objects because most of those objects, those we are missing, a lot of them are faint. And then we will be able to have more reliable global studies and understand how those uh, objects evolve. Um, so far, the detection of extended nebulae uh, has been done using mosaics and uh, different type of binnings. We have been um, helped in that with the amateur community, a uh, great help and which shout out to them for um, everything that they, are, that they are doing because it's really a, a lot of work to go scanning the galactic plane, although it's only between minus five and five as a, uh, for IFAS at least. Uh, we're already in the next step of the analysis. So it's not just, um, although we are continuing to unveil new data, we are also analyzing those that we uh, that we detected using multi-wavelengths, multi-technique studies, and we are seeing some really interesting uh, results. Uh, IFAS is part of EGAPS. So EGAPS is for European Galactic Plane Survey, so it is combined with UVEX and VFAS Plus in the south, as I just said. And in terms of detection, well, uh, machine learning and the addition of new surveys, for example, would be a great tool to find new planetary nebulae and to find other nebulae. So I hope that I convince you that there's a lot to do and uh, a lot of really interesting objects that you can unveil in the galactic plane. So the galactic plane is not that place that we know 100%. There are still a lot, a lot going on in the galactic plane. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lohans, for this great overview. So it is really clear that IFAS is a very powerful survey and it is already helping in, in, and will help us uh, learning a lot about not only planetary nebulae, but also many other objects and, the, and as you said, in the end, the, the galactic plane. So just so, so our viewers uh, know, uh, uh, Lohans, maybe, maybe you, you can try uh, turning on your camera uh, yeah. so the, the viewers can see you a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. So, 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 so our viewers know I will not turn on my camera because in, during some tests we did uh, prior to the talk, if I turn on my camera, so the connection uh, is becomes a little bit unstable and Lohans cannot hear me. So that's why I will not appear on camera today. Sorry for that, folks. But you can see our speaker, and that's the most important thing. And 
now we can move on to the to the questions, Lohans. Okay. So, uh, so first, starting with a, a comment. So Denise says that here. So it's really great to see the big effort of IFAS uh, PNE group to find extended PNE. So, uh, so this is uh, basically it's yeah. very similar to 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 what I said, and it's really nice because Denise is really an expert in the the area. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, so you know that. So it's 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 nice that a uh, lot of people are recognizing the great effort the group and you also uh, are doing. And congratulations for that, by the way. Thank you. So I'll put here the question from uh, Karin. Uh, she comments later. Uh, she, she has a comment later, but here she says that you have mentioned that, uh, sorry if you mentioned this, but do you identify uh, planetary nebulae just as point source in your H-alpha maps or are there additional color cuts? Are there contaminants? Okay, so for the point source, what they are doing, uh, um, they are only doing photometry. Well, it's point, well, I just want to make the difference between point source and compact because it can be a different, um, different connotation. So really the point source is those we are like the uh, FWHM of the a couple of percent of the FWHM of your of your stars. So all those they are doing photometry. So it's another team mostly working on uh, working on the, who worked on that. So you can check the article by Kertu Vironen uh, who uh, was specialized in working on those on those point source. So what they were doing is first to try to have color color map using only this filter that we're using in uh, with IFAS, and they use also other um, other surveys. For example, in the infrared, for example, two mass, which is the which is the best, and uh, with those um, with those. Um, Oh, diagnostic, sorry, these are those diagnostic diagram where they were able to identify which, where we have those PNR. But those point source PNR, we didn't use the mosaics, we didn't use the maps, okay? So we just, we they used the catalog of objects that were identified in IFAS. And uh, this the same catalog, you can find it in the, if you go to the IFAS in, uh, Vizier, for example, you can download, if you can download all those, uh, well, that's quite a lot, actually, but you could see all those, uh, all those objects. The uh, one from Barentsen et al. in 2014 got the latest on the, and the Mongyo in 2020, they have the latest data on those, uh, on those point source where we the, um, the best astrometry and photometric data. So we use all those photometric catalogs for those uh, point source objects. Um, other cuts, except for the, um, for the optical and the infrared, I don't think so. I don't remember, but I don't think so. And the contaminants. Uh, well, contaminants, it's everything for us. Of course, the contaminants are everything which are, uh, that are not planetary nebulae. But that could the contaminants for one, it's a good object for the other. So the, what you find is, uh, for example, you have um, a lot of um, emission line stars. You have uh, you can have symbiotic stars. But for example, Romano Corradi is working on those, uh, and his group is working is more interested in those symbiotic stars actually. Um, what do you have again as a compact? Well, all the objects that are emitting H alphas that are compact enough will be found, actually. So for us, those are the, as we are looking for planetary nebulae, those, for those are the contaminants. But they are not uh, disregarded. They are just given the proper classification that you are, that what they are. So someone else can be interested in those, uh, in those objects. I hope I answered the question. Okay, Lohans, thank you very much. And I realized that I skipped actually the first question here from Thiago. Sorry, oh. Thiago, but I'll, I'll come back to it right now. So Thiago says mm -hmm. he imagines surface like JPS uh, helps with the science, but surface brightness is still a challenge, right? So how deep 
uh, one would need to go to detect the faint old uh, planetary nebulae. Yes, uh, indeed. The, if you even if you are if you have another survey like uh, JPAS, so that even if you have the right filters, maybe the only one that you will be able to detect are still the bright object. So, uh, for example, IFAS is going to uh, in surface brightness ten to the minus seventeen hertz per centimeter square per second per arc second square. Actually, so this is basically that deep that you would need to go to start to detect those objects. But the thing is that once you go to that threshold, you can use beaming. And I encourage people who are looking for old objects, even if the, the, GPS, the GPS data, once you have them, you can use beaming to try to, uh, to um, retrieve those objects. But something uh, a survey like ifas as i said yes 10 to the minus 17 which is this is at least where you would need to go to detect those uh, those uh, old objects it's still it's a challenge but i think that uh, we shouldn't put our mind like it's difficult once you start doing it and you you always will find a way to put them to bring them back actually so there's different uh, way of uh, dealing with the images and you can still i think it's possible to have uh, to uh, to retrieve them of course uh, for a jpass where you have for example the all those filter of eye excitation i think that we can forget about that because you will not uh, you will not find those uh, you will not find those type of emission in those objects Maybe, of course, you will have the H alpha, you will have the nitrogen two, uh, maybe sulfur two, and oxygen, some line of oxygen, but uh, that's it. You will not have, for example, uh, I don't know, the oxygen three forty three sixty three, for example. Those, that would not, uh, for those old objects, that would be, except if it's an exceptional object, but that will be really rare to go uh, to use those filter to go that deep. So yeah, that's the that's the level where you will have to go. Actually. Okay, Lawrence, thank you very much. So now we will move. To, so Denise is very anxious that I ask her, her question because she she's pointing me that uh, there is a question before. So I, I'm getting to it, Denise. Don't worry, because I was reading them in order. So I started with Karin's, went back to Thiago's, and now signed for Denise's question. So she mentions here that she's not sure you're ready uh, in Sage to answer this, but would you say that the tension between the expected versus the observing number of planetary nebulae can be solved with the detection of the extended ones? It can be in part. Because uh, remember, as I said, you can not only the extended one are missing, you have some compact one that are missing in some, uh, in some places, the very crowded one, because we do find a lot of uh, compact planetary nebulae as well. So all those compact planetary nebulae is because they were very far away or they were, as I said, in a, very, in a place where you have uh, very crowded with stars. So not only the extended, but you have also the participation of the compact. Uh, what is the balance between those? I don't know. I couldn't say right now. But something also which is uh, interesting is for the, the detection of the extended ones that I would like to mention is the correlation with the round. Because as I said in the presentation, um, I read from here and there and from in different conferences as well, that maybe the, the non-detection or the poor well, not the poor, the low detection rate of round planetary nebulae could be due to the fact that those are low surface brightness, extended low surface brightness planetary nebulae. So maybe in that case, uh, I go, I jump to the morphological case. In that case, maybe uh, that detection, the observed versus the, the expected, might be solved for the detecting the extended one, actually in the case of those run, uh, those run planetary nebulae. But never forget that it's not just the extended, we also missing some compact as well. Okay, thanks, Lohans. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take the chance to 
uh, continue with some uh, a comment from Denise. So she thanks you for mentioning JPS, and she also points out that uh, her gr uh, her group is part of that survey, and they are developing deep machine learning tools to search for planetary nebulae and symbiotic stars there. So well, perfect. So that's good. So maybe we can at some point start to compare because uh, in IFAS we have not started yet on that uh, machine learning. Uh, I'm still old fashioned with the visual <laughs> detection. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, this is something that we've, uh, we've talked about uh, maybe with a student that would be interested in doing that kind of stuff for IFAS, but great. So at least we can, uh, we can have someone to can, uh, we can rely to, we can answer uh, if we have some issues for the, for the detection. So great. Okay, so moving on to the last two questions. So the first one from uh, Thiago. So he asks if there is any citizen science project to search for planetary nebulae and similar extended objects in survey data. No, no. At least for IFAS, uh, we tried to do that at some point really a long time ago, and I, I don't know why actually didn't, I didn't went by. The thing is we are in communication with um, uh, amateur astronomers. And those are people that we've been working with for a long time, actually. Uh, some of them, uh, they basically they go to my thesis and try to see the objects that they have and try uh, listed there and try to image them. And sometimes some of them also have a spectrograph. And they're not high resolution spectrograph, but enough to uh, separate, for example, the, the sulfur lines in some cases, so they can help us also to do some identification. So it's not a citizen project as such, but it's more, uh, um, how can I say that? Um, let's say it's not formal. It's an informal one with a group, a community of, uh, of, astro of uh, amateur astronomer. But uh, yeah, that could be something that we could uh, that we could do because the mosaics are there, so it would basically be uh, easy to just let people go through them and look for uh, look for the look for the different object that they could find. Actually. But yes, this is something that we that we could do. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, that would be very interesting because mm -hmm. uh, people people usually are very very interesting. Uh, helping with these projects and especially the, yeah. the planetary nebulae. People are fascinated by the beautiful images, so yes. it would call lots of attention from the public. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to the last question. We have a question from uh, Marco. He's a student here at Valongo Observatory and he got curious about the binning technique. So are you the ones who choose where each beam will be placed in the image? If you choose where to put them, which parameters do you use to decide where to put them. Okay, the binning is for the all um, the all mosaics, so it's not a particular. We do not bin at particular region. We bin the full mosaics, so at least there we do not have uh, we do not have any issue. So the criterion that we use is after a lot of um, test and error to check. Uh, what it, I show in the presentation the final parameter that we use to do the to um, define the beaming uh, and the, the, the technical details that we need for them to build actually the mosaics and uh, so that the beaming could be uh, to good result in a, in a good way. But the beaming is done on the full mosaic. The full mosaic is beaming. That means that you take all the different frame that you built. So the, how it goes. I fast observe with different, doing different frames. All the different frames, we put them through uh, um, some criterion of quality. So all those quality criteria must meet the one that I put in my, uh, in the, that I presented in the presentation. Once we took the best one, we use them to create our mosaics. One, it's a mosaic, it's, of course it's uh, one, Absolutely, one uh, beaming, uh, one beaming mosaics, one uh, pixel mosaics, and then once you have that, you have your uh, you beam it at five, 
and at 15. Why 5 or 15? Because we checked that it was the best compromise between the weight and what you want to, uh, to be able to, uh, to detect. So we used the 5, which is, was not too, ev too heavy, but enough to detect the compact uh, nebulae enough to detect the one that were not picked up by the photo by the photometry and the 15 because here we it's not degrading too much the um, the mosaics and you can pick up the extended nebulae okay, okay thanks Laurence. so uh that brings us to the end of the questions but just so you know uh karin uh thank you for your thank answer you so so it was clear when you answer uh, her question. And Denise mentioned that uh, she, she, certain, she, she mm -hmm. shared that at certain point, uh, the efforts to better address the number count of planetary nebulae should be joined. So yeah. that's very, very interesting too. So, and also we have some, some, uh, some comments here. So Ariana Cortesi uh, okay. says, you gave a beautiful talk, and then uh, Denise agrees with that. So, and congratulates you for the talk. And finally, we have a message from Isabel, uh, oh, okay. and she also thanks you for the great talk. And indeed, it was a, a great talk. I would like to to also congratulate you, and not not only for your work, but the the for the uh, congratulate the whole IFA scene. So it's a very important work that yeah. you guys are doing. So congratulations for that. And thank you very much for giving us this uh, very nice overview about the, the survey and all the, the very interesting results that's already producing. Uh, and before we close, do you want to, to add anything? To, uh, to just, the audience? To th just to thank you very much for uh, for listening, and uh, I'm happy that uh, the talk was uh, that you, at least you liked the talk, and that uh, I was able to convey what we were doing in IFAS. And as um, Denise was saying, so I'm all up to it to uh, to collaborate and to participate because really it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. So. Two teams, I think it's gonna be at what at a minimum of what it takes to do uh, to do that to do that project. So, uh, anything you need, well, you can anyway. You have my uh, you have my email address. So, if you have any question of uh, something that we can do all together, just let me know. Okay, thank Lance. you again. Okay, thank you, thank you for this mm -hmm. very nice talk. And that's very exciting news for all the people, for all the planetary nebulae fans. That's so, so you see students, that's lots of work to, to, to be done in yeah. this field. So, uh, and very exciting, very promising, very exciting results and data. So all the tools are there. Very, very, lots of interesting things to, to, to work with in the future. Okay, so with this, we come to the end of another talk. Thank you very much for all, all of you for, for being with us. We will have a two week break now. We will be back in uh, March, in the beginning of March with uh, the last three talks of the semester. And before we close, so Denise also thanks you for your availability, for giving Thank us you. this talk. And for all, uh, for all of you that follows us, on our social media, please stay tuned for the next talks. We have very interesting talks to close the semester in March. So thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again.